today is really exciting. We have a special guest, uh, Rosalie Hazlett, who is a, um, a nature illustrator, nature journaler, um, observer, artist, and writer. Um, just came out with a, a new book, which is a wonderful way to demystify the process of putting watercolor on the page. For a lot of us, when we first start, colored pencils are kind of a, it's like, this is really intuitive, right? Um, I know how to use this. Um, but you look over at people who are using watercolor and it seems like, like it, it can be this, uh, this tool that is like really, really effective to get results that you want and, um, and it happens fast. But when you start with watercolor, it can be very, very confusing. So there's a little bit more of a, a learning curve in, the, in playing with watercolor. For, for me, when I started um, playing with watercolor, my introduction to it was, was um, Grandma Audie. And Audie um, gave me my first set of watercolors. And she told me that, you know, Jack, there, she said, honey, there are no rules. Just play with it and see what it does. And um, that, so I was able just to kind of mess around with it. And I wasn't worried that I was doing something wrong. Um, I did find it challenging because what I ended up doing is I was, you know how those, those watercolor sets come with that big kind of mop of a brush that nobody can do anything oh. with. <laughs> so I, I, I had, that was my tool and um, I also think I was just using too much water. I had these big puddles and then the puddles would merge. And th that um, sort of was one of my kind of initial challenges. Something that you've done, I've seen the, the uh, I got an advanced look at your book. Something that I really appreciate is that you kind of step-by-step -step demystify a lot of the process and help people in a kind of fun and friendly way, be able to kind of get around the, those, those, those challenges with results that are the kind of motivate you to want to do the next one and the next one and the next one. Um, so Rosalie, I'm really delighted that you are here with us. And thank you so much for, for taking this time to share with us a little bit about your thinking and process. And I understand that you're going to kind of unpack for us kind of a, a, a kind of a key idea that helps you with your watercolors. Yeah, well, thank you so much for having me. I feel really honored to be here. Just quick disclaimer, there is this crazy beam of light that's like attacking my face. Right now. <laughs> and I know it's like almost Halloween and I look like a vampire and I'm so sorry. I don't know what's <gasps> happening. I know I'm like a very white person in general, but this is just a new level with this light. <laughs> I apologize. I think it looks better on the overhead camera, hopefully. So um, yeah, I don't know what's happening here. But yeah, I wanted to share a little bit about my beginning, you know, story with watercolor. So I grew up loving to draw and I felt pretty comfortable with drawing. I worked on those skills a lot to develop them. I loved the way that watercolor looked. Um, and so I would often incorporate watercolor into my drawing. So I'd start with an ink pen, a permanent ink pen, and then I'd go over it with just a few splashes of watercolor. And so I'd be like, oh yeah, I, I do watercolor, but I didn't really like understand how to create something that looked good with watercolor only. I really relied, in, relied on those ink outlines to create something that looked good. And it wasn't until about five years ago that I started feeling more confident with watercolor. And that's because I decided, I don't know how watercolor works without using a pen outline, which I think is a great way to get started. And I think it's totally a cool style. And I use it a lot now, the pen and ink and watercolor combo. But at the time, it was definitely a crutch because I just didn't understand how to uh, have any control with watercolor. I didn't know how to make things look vibrant or detailed. So back in like, I think 2016 or so, I decided to go a year without using my ink pen. And that was like a big deal for me because a lot of my work at the time was pen and ink with watercolor layered over top. And throughout that year, I just really focused on 
trying to crack that mystery. And a few of the things that kind of were breakthroughs for me are things that I'd like to share today. And I'm gonna to get to as much as I can today, but um, it took a while to, to get all of these techniques. So they're all in my book, um, shameless plug, but I'll get to some of my favorite tips and kind of breakthroughs that I learned today. So I wanted to start by sharing three watercolor roadblocks that I encountered and also that in teaching others, I feel like they're really common roadblocks. This light is crazy. <laughs> I feel like I'm in a club or something, but anyway, we'll try to get through it. It, it, um, okay. it, it, it's it's uh, on 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 our end. It's probably more distracting for you because there's bright light right in your face. Yeah. Um, I like I have a, yeah, but but um, it's 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 gonna be fine. Okay. Looks great. All right, I'm gonna try to rock it. Um, so the first roadblock that I came up with as I was thinking through this and trying to distill it down is that. It can be really hard to get started with watercolor if you feel like your drawing skills aren't strong enough. And I know from teaching workshops that a lot of people feel this way. And it is true that the drawing, the sketches is the foundation of your painting. So if you're feeling like those aren't great, then your painting probably won't turn out super well. So there are a few things that I've um, learned that can kind of help you work through those insecurities about your, your drawing skills. The first one is, um, when you're starting out, try to work from a flat reference, a 2D reference. Oh, the light is so much better now. There's a cloud. Um, so I like to work from an iPad. This is a really crappy iPad that does not work for like the internet or anything, but it happens to be good for putting my own reference photos that I take on here and I lay them right beside what I'm working on. And working from a 2D subject is just a great way if you feel uncomfortable drawing 3D subjects from life, which you'll eventually graduate into and it's super fun. But while you're getting started and gaining your confidence, working from something 2D is so, so helpful. So I often will reference something on my iPad. I often reference books. So a great way that I found to practice my watercolor skills, and especially a few years ago when I was getting started, I got a bunch of these nature books that have large photos that I could um, check out and you know do my best to try to replicate. Um, and that's another tip is to work from a reference image or a subject, whether that's a leaf or a feather or something else that's kind of flattish, work from something that's about the same size as you want your painting to be. Because I find that a lot of people try to look at tiny reference photos on their phone or something and then it's really hard to get those proportions right as you scale up to try to fill up your page on um, with your painting. So another tip for sketching to begin your painting is to sketch as lightly as possible. This is another, uh, I think, mistake that a lot of us make is we kind of feel like stressed out. So we're like trying to really press down as we sketch because we want to make everything perfect. But if you sketch really loosely and lightly, then you'll be able to erase as you go. Um, and you don't get as attached to those lines because you just kind of put in a few basic lines, you can adjust it. I erase so much as I'm building up my sketch before I start painting, because after you put the watercolor in, you can't go back and erase the watercolor. So it's really important to take your time with the sketch, but don't you don't need to put in all the details in the sketch. I'll kind of show you an example of that in the book. So I included, um, I'll do a little overhead shot. So in the book, I have all the steps one by one. The lighting's still a little funky, but we're working with it. Um, and yeah, you can see that in my first few sketches, oh, let's see. First few sketches, they're just super, super simple outlines. So I didn't include many details. Little by little, I'm adding in a few at a time. But then later when I go in to, to paint, that's when I'm adding a lot of the details. So with your basic sketch, don't worry about um, putting in too many details. And then, oh, this is my favorite tip because when I teach workshops, a lot of the time I see people working on their sketch and they make their sketch so small. Like I have people draw birds that are like two inches tall and I'm like, this is gonna be very challenging when you put in 
your watercolor because you're not going to be able to get any of those details that you really admire in your subject and want to capture. So even though it feels scary to go big, try to fill up your page as much as you can. All right, so roadblock number two is that, and this is one that I dealt with so much, and it was very intimidating for me, but every time I went to start a watercolor, I felt like it would start off fine with the first layer. And then as I added layers, it would become muddy and everything would kind of blend together. The way that I describe it is like, it was like an explosion of water. I didn't know how to have any control without those outlines. So my tip there is just to use less water. Um, and I think I actually remember one day where it really clicked for me that I needed to think about watercolor more like a drawing, kind of like you're drawing with colored pencils rather than a painting, because at least this worked for me. When I was thinking of it as a painting, I was using too much water. I was trying to make everything super fluid uh, and I wasn't able to get the details and the nice line work that I wanted uh, because I was just, yeah, I was using too much water and I lost control. So my tip there is to use less water, think of it more like a drawing and to work in layers. Um, and this is something in my book that like after every single step, I put a little reminder to let it dry completely. Let that layer dry completely before moving on because so many people just aren't patient. And there is, there is a style, a wet on wet style that means that you have like a one wet layer and then you add in little like dollops of other colors. And some people are masters at it and it's awesome. I haven't quite cracked that code yet. So, and I think that if you're a beginner, it kind of helps to simplify the process to work in those layers. So you put one layer down like I did here. This is all one color that I cover. I kind of like blocked in this whole beetle from my nature book in. And then I took my paper towel and I dabbed up a few sections where I wanted there to be a slightly lighter layer. But this is all just one shade of green. And then I can go back in and add more layers and uh, it'll just, there'll be so much more control with that. And then the third major roadblock that I think that people face is that the paintings lack contrast. So I, for a while, I kind of thought that watercolors just were muted and they like kind of had that grandma look because they were very, very muted and soft pastel colors. And I didn't know that you could achieve really beautiful, deep, rich colors with a lot of contrast with watercolors until I saw a few people's work. And I was like, is that really watercolor? Because that looks like ink or um, wash or something else. But I learned that by establishing your value early on in your painting process, you can make sure that you're using the full range of colors and that will help you have a lot of pop and interest with your painting. So right now I'm gonna demonstrate how I take this one uh, layer, this green layer, and I'm gonna add value and make it look way more like the reference photo in my book. Switch to an overhead. And by the way, we'll be having like a 15 minute Q&A at the end. So if you wanna put your questions in the chat, we'll look through those at the end of the session and we'll, Jack and I will answer as many as we can. All right, so I have this blocked in layer and this is kind of how I start a lot of my paintings. I try to keep my lighter areas as light as possible. And I did that only by just dabbing up while it's still wet. I dabbed up these sections that in my reference photo I saw were a little bit lighter at the top of this section and the middle of each of these sections. And then I let it dry completely. But first I wanted to just show you what I do when I'm starting a painting. Um, I definitely just dipped my uh, brush in my drinking water. So no more water for me today. Um, so I'm going to mix up the darkest color that I see in this photo, which is like a almost black. It's a, a kind of a blue green. Uh, that is very, very dark. So I'm using a little travel palette. This is actually what I use for most of my work because I'm often painting outside and I don't wanna carry a lot of materials. 
and this is a Schmincke set, which is kind of fancy for the first about four years that I was really into watercolor. I used a Windsor Newton travel palette that was $20 and I still recommend that for almost all beginners because it's yeah just very only has the colors that you need you won't be overwhelmed. So I have I'm mixing up my dark blue my dark green and then i'm going to add. Um, I think a little bit of brown to make it just a little darker. I think a, a big reason that people don't uh, make their or like realize the full value range of their paintings is that they get to a certain point like this point and they're like oh it looks pretty good like I haven't ruined it yet I hear that all the time I'm gonna ruin it if I keep going so I'll just stop and I think that fear is often the biggest hindrance to creativity because you never know what it could have looked like if you had continued on and just charged forward with a little more confidence Okay, so I have something that's pretty close and I'm going to just do a little color swatch up here. And then I'm gonna look at my subject and I'm gonna try to find the lightest colors. And like I said before, I think it's this, it's just a slightly, slightly green white that's making the highlight on the top of the beetle. So I'm gonna mix up just a really, really light like as light as possible green. All right. So now I have that scale and you can see that this is such a huge contrast between these two colors. And so I wanna, with my painting, capture all of the gradients between those two colors. And that's gonna really make my painting um, look realistic and just have a lot of interest. And something that I like to do as I'm working on adding in the value is I squint. I call it my squinting trick. I'm always squinting as I look at my paintings, but I squint and I look at my subject, whether that's in real life or a reference photo. And then I squint and look at my own painting throughout the whole process. And if I notice that the reference or subject is has darker colors than my painting, then I know that I need to go back in and add in some more layers. That squinting trick is so powerful. I don't know why it works, but it's crazy how well it works. I know. Like, I was just, trying I'm to here squinting at the screen and the contrast is so much more apparent when you yes. do that. I know. Yeah, I was trying to think about that earlier, why that works. And I think maybe it's just because when you're looking at your painting regularly, you're looking at all the details that you've already put in and you're kind of like distracted by that. But when you just boil it down to the value by squinting, um, it really makes a difference. Okay, so here I'm just going in with that darkest color. So I often do this, I'll put in, I'll block in my first layer, let it dry completely. And then I'll go in with some of my darkest shades. And I think that that helps me to get rid of that fear right off the bat. Because otherwise, if I work from light to dark, which I sometimes do, I think I often am like really timid, but if you just go for it, especially if you're in the field and you have limited time, uh, it helps me to just put in those darker shades as quickly as I can. So I'm not gonna do the whole painting right now. I'm just gonna kind of put in a few uh, very like strategic sections that'll show you how quickly it can make a difference. Um, this is also, what's, what's, what's interesting about this is that you know your, your idea of you know, drop in some of those darks early. It is incredibly powerful at kind of getting you to avoid that really anemic drawing, the one that's just super, super pale. Mm -hmm. um, and it, but it also kind of goes against the kind of the orthodoxy. Like whenever I'd look in a book on, you know, how do you do watercolor? They say go from light to dark and you get progressively darker as the drawing goes on. But then yeah. you end up down the line with a drawing that is all too um all too light i love calling it anemic i think that's a, a good way to put it because it's just like lacking some of that vibrancy that really could be there it's definitely not just a watercolor thing that it has to be muted and soft you can make really really powerful looking watercolors 
So to kind of create a little bit of like the roundedness, I'm kind of jumping around a little bit here, but I'm trying to give you my top tips all boiled down. Um, I noticed when you look at your reference photo that either side is a little bit darker because it's in shadow. So I always make sure to go in, I use a slightly smaller brush and I like these round brushes that are pointed. I'm not, definitely not um, dedicated to one brand for my watercolor materials. I use all sorts of brands. And I think the biggest uh, investment that I make in my watercolor materials is in the paper because I like to blot up mistakes a lot. I make a lot of mistakes, even though I've been doing this for a while. And if you have thick paper, that's 100% um, cotton. It will, I believe it's 100, I'm getting confused now. I forget which one is the, the better quality. Let's see what this is. This is Arches and this is, yeah, 100% cotton. So this allows you to add a little bit of water if you make a mistake and then blot it up. So, I it, try not it to doesn't do that, that thing where the paper kind of turns into little matted balls of tissue that then fall off. Oh yeah, that's like so, so sad. Actually, that was a big, a big transformation for me in my watercolor journey was when I discovered how big of a difference paper made because I was using some sort of like, uh, it was from like a discount art store and I had, yeah, it was just really bad. And it also buckled the whole time as I was working on it. Um, and I actually recently, today I'm using the 140 pound arches paper and it's on this block. And so it's really nice because it's already pre-stretched and it won't buckle. But recently I discovered with loose leaf, big sheets, when I wanna do a huge watercolor, there's 300 pound watercolor paper and it's incredible because it's so, so thick. It won't buckle at all. You don't, don't even have to tape it down or anything. So that's been, it's definitely expensive, but when you think about like how much a canvas costs for other art forms, it's not nearly as expensive as that. So, so here I'm going in and I'm just adding a little bit of darkness on either side of these rounded, areas to make uh you know the, the middle part kind of come towards you to show that it's rounded and i'm going to squint again and look at my reference versus my painting and i definitely need to add a lot more darkness to this side actually this might be a good time Ivea, if there are any questions coming in while i'm working on this a little more um, I, I saw one that came in a little while ago. Um, it was talking about how the, um, you know, if you if you're trying to avoid having too much water, how do we um, balance that when if you're trying to get a wash that will kind of smoothly cover a surface, but we don't want to have too much water on it? Um, what are your thoughts on kind of that dance? Yeah, I think that's a great question. So like with this base layer that I did before we started today, I used quite a bit of water because I was using one color and I had my outline sketched out and I was just kind of blocking in the whole thing. So I used quite a bit of water. I used a slightly bigger brush. I used this kind of round tipped brush. And while it was still wet, I smoothed it across the whole thing, but then I let it dry before I add in details. And I think that's the, mm. the big kicker. Um, and also another thing there is if you have a large area, like if I wanted to add a background to this, I would feel free to use a lot of water and bigger brush to smooth over that whole surface. But it's just for these details and for developing shadows and for like building up the layers that you wanna to try to limit the amount of water that you use. Well, that makes a lot of sense. The, um, so for, and there's nothing worse than being halfway through a wash and running out of the paint. Um, oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, though, I feel like I try not to fight that anymore because I think that when you have to go back and remix the colors, it'll inevitably be a little bit different, but that just adds this really nice, like, organic look to your work where you can tell that, the per that I didn't just go directly from one of these pots in my set and just transfer it to the page that I mixed up a color and 
it adds a lot of nice variety and nuance. So, so that's a feature. Think, yes, yeah, I think so. And <laughs> honestly, when you look at this reference, there are like different spots that are more yellow. There are different spots that are brighter mm -hmm. green mm -hmm. and bluish. Mm -hmm. So it ends up looking more realistic if you have that variety. And it's more fun because you don't have to try to make everything look like it was computer generated. Are there any other questions? Well, there was I, another one um, about how do you decide on mixing a new darker shade versus adding an additional layer of a lighter shade? Ooh, well, that's a good, very good question. So with these lighter shades, I just try to, in the beginning of my painting process, after I do my sketch, I try to look at, like identify those lightest areas. And I did that before we started to today to try to save some time. But I identified my lightest areas as being here, here, and in the middle here. And a little bit on um, this, it's called a large cephalic horn. I, I don't know if I'm saying that right, but I'm just noticing it's right there, the description. Um, so I left a little bit of the white of the paper shining through there, a little bit here, and a little bit here. And that's super good to establish really early on in your process um, because you can't really go in and add light layers later unless you have white gouache, which I can show you. I have some white gouache, I think right here. I can kind of show you the difference. Um, I sometimes use white gouache and I use this if I forgot about a highlight area and I painted over it by accident mm -hmm. um, or I knew it was there. I just like, it's a highlight on an eyeball or something. And I, I kind of was got a little sloppy with it and it got covered up. So I'll kind of show you maybe for this side, I'll add a little bit of um, water. Oh, oh, maybe before you put that in, I just want to point, point out, it's been really interesting to, you were talking about painting in layers. Mm -hmm. And as I've watched you, um, it, it's really, really clear what you're talking about. I, I really see these kind of coming in one layer mm -hmm. at a time. Um, and you can see how that, those layers on top of each other, you're letting each one then dry, that really builds up to this effect that we're, we're seeing here. Mm -hmm. um, and it's one thing to say paint in layers, it's a, quite another just to watch you at work and see those build up like this. That's been really interesting to observe. Yeah. I think it's also nice because it allows you to, instead of feeling like watercolor is gonna dry so quickly and I need to manipulate it really fast, it allows you to really take your time. And um, it's actually, I feel like it, for me, adds a little bit of a meditative aspect to my process because mm -hmm. I reach points a lot of the time where everything's a little damp. And so I have to just, hang out, look out the window, um, take a sip of tea and just like breathe for a minute as I wait for it to be ready for the next one. And I think that those like required pauses allow me to be really strategic as I decide on the next layer because I have a little extra time to think about what I want to do next. So I put a little bit of gouache on my palette and I don't normally put it right in there, but for today's purposes, I will. And so I just want to show you, maybe I'll show you, yeah, I'll show you how I could make this look a little bit, like bring out the highlights over here. Something I've noticed about gouache is that it will often look um, really nice and bright and it'll kind of match the white of the paper when you first put it on. But then as it dries out, it kind of gets chalky and loses that intense brightness. And that's part of the reason I really try to preserve the white of the paper as much as I can. Mm -hmm. I think that's really smart. I have the, run into exactly the same problem with, I put the, the gouache down and I go, well, look at what I did. Yeah. And then, and then it dries and you're like, yeah. and no. And you can really tell the difference here between um, the gouache side and the paper side. I just feel like this looks slightly chalkier and that's totally fine if that's what you're going for. And I don't think it looks bad. It's just a different look. And so you can kind of decide which one you prefer. But I always have gouache on hand because I never want to feel like I can't fix a mistake. And I think it's silly to be such a purist that you're like, oh, I'm doing a watercolor painting. I can't add in white gel pens or gouache or whatever. You can use whatever you need to make it look how you want it to look. So I think that's very freeing to. No, and that's something else too. Um, 
Sorry, I'm having a hard time painting and chatting <laughs> at the same time. But um, there's just cognitive load. You're not alone. Um, <laughs> okay. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's okay. amazing how much you've been able to manage both of those already. Okay, well, thank you. You're very encouraging. <laughs> um, that's something that I've been playing with a bit recently is incorporating a little bit more gouache into my work. So um, sometimes if I'm like in a, a little bit of a hurry as I'm working on a painting, so if I'm outside and I wanna, and I have like 20 minutes to, to quickly paint something, I'll often use gouache because you can get those really bold colors with fewer layers, actually just one layer because it's so opaque. So that's something to think about if you um, want to give that a shot. And I've even been combining them a lot lately and that's been really fun too. Just so much you, you can do when you like, don't get trapped with one specific technique that's your thing that you feel comfortable with. And I think that for a long time, that was me with pen and ink and watercolor. Oh wait, and wait say, say that again, because that is such a powerful lesson about kind of cognitively stretching ourselves. So you're intentionally, taking yourself out of your own comfort zone there. So I'd love for you to kind of expand on that idea a little bit more. Yeah, I just think that it's really easy for us when we see good results that we like from one technique or one medium, it's easy to say, this is what I do, this is my medium. And you kind of prevent yourself from growing. And I think now I feel really excited about the fact that I can use pen and ink and watercolor, I can use just watercolor alone. I'm getting more comfortable with gouache, so I can use that now. And it's a similar story with gouache. I really had never used it until this year. And I did an artist residency in Nevada and decided I wasn't gonna bring any watercolor or any other supplies because I needed to push myself to learn something new. So I got a new set of gouache. I went there and had a couple weeks just to try it out and it was intimidating, but it was also awesome. And I fell in love with gouache too. So now I have all these different tools that I can use. And so you're, you're giving yourself permission, even though you've had lots of experience as, as an artist, to, to kind of go back into that place of being a beginner again. Yeah. I, I wonder if that is one of the reasons why you're kind of you're, you're good at explaining your basic techniques and the principles behind what you're doing because you're regularly, you're, you're not that, you're, you're, you're putting yourself back in that place of being a beginner again and again. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's something that I feel like is really important. If I'm gonna teach others, I need to always remember what it feels like to feel intimidated and like a fish out of water and actually, my most recent thing that's been pushing me out of my comfort zone. In addition to gouache, I've been learning to read music and play the fiddle because I've always wanted to do it, but mm. I needed to learn it when I was a kid in order to be any good at it. And so I started taking lessons about a month ago. And let me tell you, I have a, it's a Zoom weekly class and it's just with one teacher. And there have been so many times where I just like stare at her and I say, I like, this is something that feels so foreign to me because I never learned how to read music. And it's just a really good reminder that like this stuff is, it's not easy when you're just starting out. Um, and, but it's so worth doing because it's, it's just like, I don't know. I feel like it's, it can be adrenaline fueling and it's humbling. I think it's important to never feel like you're an expert at things too much because you're there's so many other things that you could learn. You're you're also just sort of demonstrating growth mindset there that you're you're not fixed in who you are. It's not the you are you have agency in what you want your brain to be. Yeah. Um, oh, this is so much fun to see you paint these legs. You know, as you're kind of working those edges. It's then making a highlight along the top by kind of popping yeah, those. Uh, zoom in on that a little bit. So I'm not doing anything too fancy here. I'm just, I noticed in my reference that it was darker on either side. And I noticed that that's a pretty common theme. Like if you're looking at a tree straight on, normally there's shading on 
the left and right side and right through the middle, if it's rounded, it'll be lighter. And so that'll immediately make it look rounded. And that's just one of the many like formulas that if you do it enough, you kind of realize that like, there's a lot of repetition in these techniques. So even though I paint a lot of different animals and plants, I'm often doing the same techniques over and over again. So once you have that basic understanding, you can apply these skills to anything and it's very empowering. Are there any other questions that are coming in? Um, there's um, some folks were interested in, uh, you've done some interesting residency things. How do you find out about those and, and kind of get connected with residency opportunities? Yeah, so I am always applying to things. Uh, that's one of my biggest tips that I like to share too for other emerging artists is that, oh man, there are so many opportunities out there and so many people are too intimidated to apply for them. So you have a pretty good shot at a lot of them, surprisingly. Like my first residency was at Great Smoky Mountains National Park. And I looked at that residency so many times and almost didn't apply because I was 23 and didn't have a very well, you know, built out portfolio. I'd only been doing watercolor for about a year consistently. And so I didn't really feel like I was a good competitor for it. And they ended up choosing me and I applied to a bunch of other ones too and didn't get any of those, but I got one. And that really like, that experience was very impactful for me because that's where I taught my first workshop. That was part of the residency. Mm -hmm. And I don't think I would have ever thought of myself as a teacher if I hadn't been forced to teach a workshop there as part of the, the trade-off. And I ended up really liking it and feeling like it was something that I could contribute to help other people learn to be inspired by what they see and encounter outside. So um, I would recommend Googling if you are interested in a national park residency, there are a lot of those. And you can just, actually there's a landing page on I think the National Park Service website and you can just Google National Park Service artist residencies and it comes up with a big map with links to all the different parks that have them. And yeah, I would just say apply to a lot of things though. Don't, don't see like the perfect dream opportunity and think like that's the one I have to get because you're probably not gonna get it, but you might get another one eventually. And I apply to things all the time. And that's what people don't see. I spend a lot of time just crafting applications and trying to get interesting opportunities. And a lot of them don't work out and a lot of them do so or some of them do so so yeah. that that kind of ties in with your approach with the art and the 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 fiddle here mm -hmm. um if you're you're not sort of being afraid of the rejection of the residency is what's going to stop somebody from 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 trying that mm -hmm. um being afraid of the drawing not being the uh, a, a, a perfect drawing um, is going to stop somebody from, from putting brush to paper or um, changing up your medium. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, being uh, the, the fear of you know, not already being an expert prevents mm -hmm. you from picking up the fiddle. Yeah. Um, yeah, and it's not an absence of fear either. I think that a lot of people get that confused. And I read recently, it's not um, confidence that you should be going after, it's courage because you can have fear and you can have courage at the same time. And I think that's a good, something that I think about a lot because I often feel fear in these opportunities and I feel rejection when I don't get them, but, or when something turns out poorly, a painting turns out poorly or something like that. But I also try to like, allow courage to keep me applying for things and trying things and putting myself out there. That is, this is, is, is so much more here than, than our sort of, and then, then what were the lessons we're learning about putting, oh, it's, look at how you're leaving the whites. <laughs> all those little highlights coming out yeah, all over this because 
you are leaving these whites and just the, the dimension it then yeah, pulls out of the picture. In those whites. I'm just painting around those whites. And actually a good tip that that reminds me of is that sometimes when I'm blocking in a painting, so when I'm putting in those first layers and there are a few parts that I want to leave white, for example, this part, I want to paint around it. In this case, I just blotted it up while it was wet because I have, this is nice paper and I can do that. But in a lot of situations, I try to work around those highlights and I'll even write in a little W really lightly um, with pencil on all those places as I'm blocking it in to, to remind myself that that little kind of circular area needs to stay white and then I can paint around it all and then erase mm -hmm. it. All right, so at this point it's 147. Are there other questions that we have? Um, there are some questions about, well, okay, um, to continue with the whole thing about residency, somebody was asking, what do they require of you for a residency? Not very much, honestly. The, a lot of them require that you do some sort of engagement activity. And just while I'm talking about this, I'm adding in a couple uh, colors that I see that aren't super obvious to me in my reference photo, but there are, are a few little glimpses of red that are kind of being reflected off of this shiny surface. I see them on these little spikes. I'm not sure what those are called, but uh, there's kind of some red along the tips of the spikes, some red in these little pinchers. So I'm gonna mix up a dark red crimsony color. And with my tiniest brush, or this is one of my tiniest brushes, I'm gonna add in a few of those. And I feel like this is a good kind of closing detail because it just uh, shows that there isn't just one main color composing this beetle, but there are a lot of different kind of iridescent colors. But back to the residency question, one of the main things that's required is uh, some sort of engagement activity. So I've done about five residencies over the past four years, and they, for each one, you have to give a little presentation, and both, most of mine have been at parks or wildlife refuges or places where there are visitor centers. So I'll often set up at the visitor center and do some plein air painting and then answer questions from visitors as they come. And sometimes I'll give workshops at these visitor centers and stuff too. And normally you have a little bit of say over how you want to engage with the public and share what you're inspired by there. Um, and then often you're asked to donate a piece of art. It could be just a small piece. It doesn't have to be like your best work from your time there, but donate a piece of art that can go and be displayed in a public area, maybe the visitor center or like a park office so that other people can kind of see what you created while you were there. And then in exchange, you get free housing for most of the time they're between a week and one month, some of them are a bit longer, but I don't think they're normally shorter than a week. There, there's a lot of, um, oh, it seemed that the impact of that red, like hold that, that, that up again to us, if you would. This is All one right. of my secret tricks, <laughs> but it's not so secret because I love sharing it, but adding crimson to especially the tips of uh, if it's something in the natural world, I find that like the tips of a lot of leaves have a tiny bit of crimson or, you know, the, these little pinchers and everything. Adding a little bit just really carries your eye around the page. And I don't know. Yeah. The human and, eye and it, it just, that, that, the, that red, you know, being the complementary color, it sort of just vibrates with the green. Um, yeah. This is, and, and again, the, so you've got these dry layers and we're just, you're just putting that on with a light wash. This is, yeah, there's this yeah. whole transformation that is happening really fast right here at the end of this drawing. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of people who are watching today who are um, in uh, families that are uh, homeschooling. Awesome, I'm homeschooled. We'd, we'd love to hear just sort of a little bit about any, any um, thoughts or, or comments for um, for for people in uh, who are, are are homeschooling together um, mm -hmm. about uh, well, uh, any any messages for that community? 
Hello, homeschoolers. <laughs> I'm a survivor. I was homeschooled and I loved it. Um, I wasn't homeschooled the whole way through, but until I was about 12 years old and I yeah, had a great experience. I think one of the things that made my homeschooling experience awesome was that my dad painted with me a lot and because he was interested in it. And I think it was just so inspiring to me as a kid who liked art naturally to feel like it was something that was cool to do because the adults in my family liked to do it too. It didn't feel like, oh, now it's kid time. So we're going to paint. And because art is a kid thing to do, it was always like, no, adults like to paint too. And it's something that we can do together as a family. And like, we can kind of teach each other. And yeah, that's what I think was really valuable about art making as a family. And my dad wasn't a very good painter and he'd be the first to tell you that, but he liked to do it anyway. And I think that was another powerful lesson that I learned from a young age is that you don't have to be good at things to enjoy them. Oh, this is just seeing the, the reds come into these shadows and these little joint areas this it, it it it's bringing out just a, a whole other aspect of this painting that is fascinating there's so this is a very limited palette you're working with here yeah um, it's very messy as you can see <laughs> because i like those nuances that come about when you aren't working from primary colors so what what are the um the the, the pigments that you've got in there if you know uh, or yeah, well, I think I know most of them. I think this is a cadmium yellow, cadmium red, uh, alizarin crimson. Uh, I think this is ultramarine blue. I'm not sure what this is. Oh, I think it's cobalt blue. Mm -hmm. um, so ultramarine and cobalt are your, there's a couple of blues. Yes, there are two blues, which I wasn't really sure when I got this palette why there were two blues, but one is a bit cooler. And this one, uh, the cobalt is pretty, pretty bright. So that's a good like, ocean, bright ocean color. Ultramarine is really versatile to mix with other things. Um, mm -hmm. This green, I forget the name of the green. Yellow ochre is one of my other tricks that I whip out a lot because I think it's kind of underrated. It's this kind of not super pretty looking color on its own, but I think a lot of subjects in the natural world have this yellow tint. It's often like the color of the sun reflecting off the surface. So I use that tin all the time. And then this is a burnt umber, I believe. So yeah, I, I, like I said, I have so many watercolors and these are the ones that I go to the most because they just, I have everything I need here. <laughs> and it's not overwhelming and I don't have to pack up too many things. Mm -hmm. I guess that you've got the limited palette, but you know and you understand those. Yeah. Yep. And this, I think that you might be looking at me mixing colors and think, how am I doing that so quickly? And it's just because I've spent the last four or five years doing a ton of watercolor paintings. So yep. it comes with time. But I think there's nothing wrong at all with using paint straight from the tube, um, especially if you have a lot of interesting colors that are already some artist blended them into these beautiful colors. I think there's nothing wrong with that at all. Um, and then just before we close, I wanted to show a final technique that I do with a lot of my paintings, which is just a little bit of stippling with my smallest brush to add texture. And this beetle definitely has lots of little pores all over him. So this is what it looks like now. And wait, 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 let's, let's pause again. I want everybody just to also just sort of look at how the greens and those reds, you look at it, your brain doesn't, it doesn't scream red at you. It still reads green beetle. Mm -hmm. But look at how those reds have um, sort of changed the nature of those shadow areas. Um, just sort of so, depth. and I kind of get that sense because of the, um, because of those, you're going so dark value with that zone, mm -hmm. it really makes the, the exoskeleton of this beetle, it really feels shiny. Yeah. That contrast yeah. gives me that, 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 that shiny feel. Yeah, because you, uh, 
with the reds, I think you often look at a, a subject and you think, oh, it's just, yeah, mostly one color. And then there's a little bit of a darker shade there in the shadow areas and that's it. But there are a lot of reflected colors in your shadow areas. So adding some reds in there, adding blues in your shadow areas can make something just really look vibrant and beautiful. Um, so the stippling real quick, I just take a little bit of paint on my brush and it's kind of this darker blue brown color that I was using in the beginning. So I'm gonna mix that up. And this is another technique that is really quick to add at the end, but you just wanna make sure that everything's dry first or else it'll easily be lost and just kind of fade into everything else. But I'm just gonna go in and add some tiny dots here and there. They don't need to be perfect. Mm. And you don't need to also go over the entire surface, even though this porous texture covers the whole thing, you can kind of just place it throughout in different places to give the impression of it without spending your whole afternoon driving yourself crazy with tiny dots. Even though sometimes I do that, I'll be the first to admit. So notice how uh, Rosalie's putting a lot of these dots sort of close to that dark edge. Um, if you were yeah, here for our workshop on the moon, remember how you saw most of the details of the craters close to the line between the dark and the light side of the moon. As it is turning over, that's the place where you're going to see most of the, those, 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 those pits in the highest relief. Um, a wow, dark area a observation. I didn't even think about why I was doing that, but that's definitely why they're more visible in the when it's you're looking at it from an angle. Yeah. So that that dark line is called the terminator. And so she's got her these these this stippling. So she's stippling adjacent to that terminator line. <clears throat> we also have a question that's been asked um, a couple of times about uh, your process when deciding what to digitize or make into prints to sell, how do you decide? Oh, that's a great question. Um, so when I'm doing practice paintings like this one from a book, I would never make a print to sell because I didn't take the photo. So that's important to know that I think these books are great for practice. Not, And I think it's okay normally if you share what you painted from a book, as long as you say that it's not your photo and you give, you know, that you say which book it's from but I would never make a print out of this, which I think is good to point out because I've seen that recently. Sometimes people are making prints from tutorials, from other people's reference photos. And so, yeah, you just wanna make sure you're using your own reference photos or it's a stock image that you purchased or the best option is to uh, paint from life. And then you don't have to worry about that because nobody owns the copyright of nature. <laughs> so, um, but apart from that, I, I, like to not share my work online until a month after I've created it so that I have time to kind of determine how I feel about it so that I don't immediately, I'm not immediately subject to a lot of opinions of other people about what they, if they think it was successful or not. Cause I found that that is, I used to do that. I used to make a painting and then share it online immediately. And I found that it often, bred insecurity if I thought a painting turned out really well and then people didn't really respond well. So I try to sit on my work for a while and I'll share it with a couple of close friends. I'll share it with my husband and just kind of determine how I think about it and what my close friends that I really trust think about it. And if we all kind of agree that it's a, a better piece than normal, then I'll maybe make it into a print. So that's kind of the way I determine. Um, okay. we had, oh, sorry. Oh, I was just going to say, I'm pretty much done with the stippling, I think. So I think the final, I said, I know I said that that, that was going to be the final step. The final, final step, I think is because I didn't use much yellow, yellow ochre in this piece. And I do see a lot of um, <laughs> yellows here. I'm going to get some nice yellow on my brush and kind of why I watered it down quite a bit. And then I'm just going to go into my mid zone. So like, this is a highlight zone, this is highlight, this is highlight. So in the in-between zones, I'm gonna add a little light glaze of yellow ochre. 
and that was too dark. So, so I'm gonna add a little bit of water only on my brush and kind of diffuse it a little bit. And that'll just kind of tie together. Mm. Oh, and look what it did with the stipples. They're still there. They're, they're, it kind of pushes yeah. them back a little bit. Because they were dried. That's the key. <laughs> if they were yeah. Still, they oh, them. neat. Yeah. So I'm going to add this. Yeah, and, uh, this is so interesting. You know, I, I, I was thinking like, you know, I would reach for yellow for doing this, but the yellow ochre just gives it this. That, that's exactly, you know your colors. You know your colors. That's exactly what you want to reach for there. That's Yeah, I, I honestly don't use my cadmium yellow too much um, because I, I don't know, I kind of like the muted quality of the yellow over a little more. So mid, -light, mid lights kind of through here. And then to get rid of these harsh lines, I don't like the way that looks. I'm just going to add a little water to my brush. It's a clean brush. And I will add the water to the edges of that line to make it. Oh, soft. look at that soften. Yes. So then I'll add just a few touches to the limbs here. What a difference that makes. Mm. Wow, I need Jack to give me pep talks throughout every painting process. This is great. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it, it's it's just so much fun to kind of you, you're just so generous with your thinking process, and you've kind of you know it invited us into your brain. You're also really good at kind of articulating the decisions that you're making. And a lot of people you can see them make a pretty picture, but they're not good at articulating those decisions. And I think that that's something that is um, that really comes across in your book. It's that just as we're sort of seeing here is that that you're really good at breaking those 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 those, those down and inviting us into the you know each one of these things it's there's a decision and another decision and another decision um, and the you you you've 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 shown us what those are with real vulnerability and it makes us it makes it just so much easier to learn from oh, yeah. um, if people want to learn more from you um and and follow you um in addition to getting your book um how can we keep track of the shenanigans that you're getting into <laughs> Um, well, I get into a lot of shenanigans because I'm always just excited about uh, trying all sorts of things. So uh, I think in the top of the chat, Ivea posted my Instagram and I try to share some behind the scenes pretty regularly. At least once a week, I share the painting process behind something that I'm working on. I'm always working on something new. So that's a great place for it. Um, she also shared a link to my website and I have a blog on there and a monthly newsletter that's really fun. I try to make it feel like a letter to the people that get it and include kind of random things that I'm inspired by that month. So I love it if you wanted to subscribe to that. And then she also posted a link to my book, which is right here and which I'm excited to be able to give a copy away to someone that's here today. And Jack came up with a good plan for selecting our person. Do you want to go ahead and do that now? That's that's right. So um, one lucky viewer is going to get a copy of your 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 book here. And what I'm going to be doing is um, I've I'm going to be just sort of uh, randomly scrolling around on the um, on the participant list here. And at some point, Rosalie, you get to say and stop. And okay. at that point, um, I will see which, uh, wh whose name my cursor is above. And so I'm just bouncing around on it. And whenever you're ready. You're already going, you're already bouncing. Oh, I'm bouncing. I've been okay. bouncing this whole time. Okay. Okay. And stop. Oh, it's me. Oh, how about that? <laughs> yeah. oh, surprise, surprise. There's some John Muir laws on here. <laughs> um, so, um, hey, um, Linda J, um, 
I want to congratulate you. You are the winner of the uh, the, the the drawing here. Uh, way to go, Linda. And um, would you please, Linda, send a, um, uh, you, you can either send an email to me. I'm at John Muir Laws at johnmuirlaws.com, or you can use the chat uh, right now to send a direct message to Rosalie um, and give her your email. You'll be in touch, and then you're going to get your own copy of the book. So we can also support you by um, uh, going to your website. And so not just going to um, Amazon and, and getting the book, but if you want to get the book, go to Rosalie's website, which will bring you to Amazon. And then when you get the book through her um, link to Amazon, it supports her and her family more. Yeah, um, or whatever local bookstore you you like. I really like Indie Book. I think it's called Indie Books. Is that what it's called? Indie Bound. Indie Bound and uh, Bookshop are really cool websites that allow you to support your local bookstore too. So those are really fun. Yeah. Um, th so there is, uh, there's, uh, I don't know if you've been following the chat, but uh, the people are sending you a lot of love. Um, you've got, so uh, we're so grateful for you sharing um all of this with us yeah and i just remembered something i have a um i'm gonna screen share for just one second and you show do. you a handout that i made that you can uh we're gonna attach it as a pdf to where are we gonna have it jack um so uh when you go to johnmuirlaws.com where you see a recording of this workshop that will be a download that will be right there. Oh, this and is this is just so clear. Happen? When will that uh, be up, do you think? Um, we're gonna try to get it up uh, soon um, because we want to be sort of supporting your 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 book launch. Um, the uh, so we'll 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 try to 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 get on that. Awesome. Yeah. So you all all will have a kind of a summary of everything that I talked about today and yeah, best of luck with all of your paintings going forward. And yeah, so fun to be here. <laughs> this was an absolute delight. Wow. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, everybody.